Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the St. Charles Community College panel on the COVID-19 vaccination process. My name is Paul Rosler and I'm the chair Hi, of the good afternoon. science department here at Welcome SEC. Welcome to the St. Charles Community a College panel. A group of us here COVID at SEC have been planning process. a presentation uh, My name on is COVID Paul vaccines Rosler, for a while. Hi, good afternoon. Et cetera. And after last week's pause of the J&J &J vaccine, we felt it urgent that we have this discussion sooner rather than later, which is why we are here today. Um, our panel of experts is gonna talk about the vaccine from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds. Steve Randall, SEC history faculty member, will discuss the history of the vaccines. Nicole Panair, SEC biology department chair, and Amy Culler, provost of the Dardeen Creek campus and former nursing faculty, will explain some of the medical questions surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines, such as how they work, their effectiveness, and the importance of herd immunity. Lisa Randall, my fellow political science faculty member, will discuss the FDA approval process and what the J&J &J pause actually means. Our panel will end, uh, hopefully, with Sarah Evers, the Assistant Director of the St. Charles County Department of Public Health, who will discuss St. Charles's efforts to administer the vaccines. So our plan is to have time at the end for questions. I'll keep tabs on questions posted on YouTube, so please ask away. Most of us, by the way, are not used to a lot of these Zoom panels, so bear with us if we have some technical issues. All right, so, so let's kick off with uh, Steve Randall discussing the history of vaccines. All right, so uh, to begin with, my name is Steve Randall. I am professor of history here at St. Charles Community College. The history of vaccination actually does not go back all that far into history. It starts, interestingly enough, in 1768 with a question a 13 year old boy working as an assistant to a pharmacist asked a young lady if she had smallpox. And although she was feeling sick, she says, no, I've had the cowpox before, I can't get smallpox. And Edward Jenner never forgot that little conversation. And when he became a doctor, he put that to the test and he developed a vaccine from cowpox, which he gave to people, starting with a young boy by the name of James Phipps, in order to protect them against smallpox. And it worked. Okay? Consequently, other vaccines have been developed and smallpox essentially has been eradicated from most places around the earth. The next major step in vaccination comes in 1885 when a mother brought her young son, Jacob Meister, to a scientist. She was afraid her son was going to die from rabies. He'd been bitten by a rabid dog. And people said, well, there's nothing we can do for you. Maybe if you go to this scientist in Paris, maybe you can help you. She goes to the Institute, the scientist opens the door and the mother begged Louis Pasteur to save her son's life. And Pasteur had something that worked on animals. He didn't know if it would work with people. He could hardly turn down a grieving mother. And so he gave his vaccine to a young boy by the name of Jacob Meissner. And there's a statue now of Jacob in front of the Pasteur Institute is the rabies vaccine worked. Okay. The next incident in vaccination comes with the discovery of viruses. In the 1930s, people thought bacteria were the source of disease. And so people discovered antibiotics, but antibiotics didn't work on certain things. And so in the 1930s, people discovered viruses. Antibiotics didn't work on viruses, but vaccines did. Smallpox was a virus. Rabies was a virus. And in the 1930s, it was discovered that polio was a virus. And so since the president of the United States was the most famous polio victim in the country, People began working towards a polio virus and raising money 
through what became known as the March of Dimes. As little children, little grade school children donated dimes to scientific research to stop polio. And this research paid off. And in the 1950s, 1954, the March of Dimes financed a study, a test of a vaccine developed by none other than Dr. Jonas Salk. And again, it worked. And polio has been virtually eradicated from some countries around the world. These three people, Jenner, Salk, Pasteur, these are three of the biggest names of science. And their efforts to combat disease have paid off and there have been more developments since in terms of a mumps vaccine, in terms of a measles vaccine, in terms of uh, certain cancers now, uh, HPV being vaccinated against. This saves millions and millions of lives. Millions of millions of children have been born without being blind, without being deaf. Vaccines work, okay? And this is why we have vaccination it comes from the Latin word for cow. That's where Jenner got it. Vaca is the Latin word for cow. So we call it vaccination. And it's been very, very successful in eradicating many diseases around the world. When we have a public health problem today, what do we do? We take social distancing steps, we wear masks, and we work on a vaccine. That's true in the past, it is still true today. Okay, so I will hand it off to my science colleagues to talk more about the specifics of what a vaccine does and how it's made. Thank you, Steve. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Nicole Panier. I'm the biology department chair and an assistant professor of biology. And I'll be speaking with Amy Kaler. Hi everybody, I'm Amy Kaler. I am the um, provost of the Darden Creek campus and also the vice president of workforce and healthcare uh, here at St. Charles Community College. So welcome, we're really glad you're here and um, Nicole, take it away. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so we'll need to share our screen. Hopefully you can see that here and <clears throat> Amy and I are going to be speaking first about a little bit about the uh, coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Then we're going to talk specifically about the RNA vaccines that are available and how they work. And then a little more about herd immunity and why vaccination for COVID-19 still matters. Okay, so you probably have seen this image circulating in media outlets or online. And this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we're gonna talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 and <clears throat> what these little red things are sticking out of the surface of the virus, because that's gonna be really important, okay? So first we wanna talk about what is a virus. And Steve mentioned a little bit ago about bacterial infections. And uh, then we discovered viruses. So what are they? They're really interesting in the fact that they have either a DNA or RNA genome. So humans have a DNA genome that's gonna be our genetic information, but viruses can be DNA or RNA. And the difference is, <clears throat> or what, why uh, they might have one or the other is because RNA viruses kind of skip a step and don't require the DNA. And I'll explain why in just a bit. But in humans, DNA is necessary to produce RNA, which allows us to make protein, okay? And so the viruses have some kind of genome that's enclosed in some sort of shell, okay? And <clears throat> we have all sorts of different viruses, those that can infect many different types of hosts. So it's important to note that viruses cannot survive on their own. They require a host. And so the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, is host is either human, cell, uh, human cells or it can be found in animals too. So here's another look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
It is an RNA virus. So this has its genetic information encased in this shell. And then sticking out of the surface of the virus is the spike protein. And that is the red thing. Those are the red things that you see st sticking out in this image on the right. It is the spike protein that allows the virus to attach to human cells at a structure called the ACE2 receptor, okay? And so when the virus comes to uh, a cell, it attaches to the ACE2 receptor and then can enter into the cell to infect it, right? It should be noted here as well, though, that simply washing your hands and using soap can disrupt this outer shell and is very effective in protecting us against infection. Which really, Nicole, means that it can't attach anywhere. <laughs> if we yes. can do all we can to keep what you are seeing in the picture, not to be too simplistic, from, from <laughs> attaching to that ACE2 receptor, that's a really powerful thing because then it can't replicate, right? So right. those kinds of things about wearing a mask and hand washing and stopping not just the spread, but actually the structure, if we can change the structure itself, then it makes it harder for it to I know you would use it better, Nicole, but attach um, yes. so that we can't, you know, can't replicate. That's right. Exactly right, Amy. Thank you. So what Amy was just talking about, we're going to take oh. a look at that here. Yeah, that was perfect. So we see that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can attach using those spike protein on these ACE2 receptors on our human cells. And then what viruses do as part of their replication cycle, like Amy says, they enter into the host cell. Now, viruses are not living organisms on their own, so they require the host cell to help them replicate. And so what they do is they will use the host cell, what we call machinery, this little structure called a ribosome and host enzymes to replicate its structure so that it can reform. And then the virus will move out of the host cell and move on to other cells for infection. <clears throat> so what we are trying to do with the vaccine is introduce some part of a virus, typical traditional vaccines will introduce some part of a weakened or dead virus or bacteria and present them to your, your immune system, where then your immune system and your white blood cells will produce antibodies to help you fight the disease and protect you for long term. So a vaccine essentially teaches your immune system what the infection might look like, and it allows you to create these antibodies that will help fight the disease upon future infection, okay? So <clears throat> a little bit about what are antibodies. So antibodies, of course, are human-made proteins. We make them. And like I mentioned just a moment ago, exposure to a virus or a bacteria, some kind of pathogen, that's a disease-causing agent, will allow your body to create antibodies that are gonna be specific for that disease-causing agent. And Nicole, oh, yeah. I think this is really important because people are hearing a lot about, oh, I do I need to get vaccinated or not? And we'll, we'll get into that later about if you've had um, COVID mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if, if you can test your antibodies and those that have tested your antibodies. So that's why I feel like this description that you're, you're giving right now is, is so important for, for anybody listening in. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Perfect. So yes, on the, on the left, you see just this blue blob looking thing representing some kind of vi virus or bacterium that might be in your bloodstream. And as you see, there are structures that stick out of the surface of that um, disease causing agent, a lot like the spike protein in the image that we saw before. Your body can produce antibodies that typically are in Y shape. And on the end of the Y shapes are uh, regions that can attach to these specific structures sticking out of the disease causing agent. And they're going to be specific and match up like a lock and key almost. Okay. So the types of antibodies that we produce after vaccination from the COVID-19 vaccine are these over here, neutralization antibodies. 
And what antibodies do is they help us destroy these foreign invaders and they can do many different things, but the ones that we're primarily making in response to the COVID-19 vaccines are called neutralization antibodies. And so these antibodies, if you see these little Ys kind of surround this structure here and are gonna kind of clump onto the structure and make it very difficult for a virus or a bacterium to infect a host cell. So here's another image of neutralizing antibodies. And specifically this image here is coming from um, the Journal of American Medical Association. And you can see that these neutralizing antibodies attached to that red spike protein that sticks out of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and bind to specific parts of that spike protein to prevent it from entering and being able to bind to, to the ACE2 receptor. So without that binding, like Amy said before, the virus cannot enter into our cells and cannot replicate. It's like barrier. It's really a good example mm -hmm. of that barrier that says it, it, if it can't get in there, it can't replicate. And that's really what we, we want to create for, for keeping people safe and healthy. Great. Thank you. So how are we developing vaccines against COVID-19? We obviously have been using some traditional strategies. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccines use more traditional strategies. But also scientists developed a new way to create a vaccine, RNA vaccines, and those would be the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, okay? So like I said, the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca vaccines use a more traditional approach. It's called adenoviral delivered or adenovirus delivered, where another virus is used to actually infect your cells to then bring in parts of um, uh, another virus and you build antibodies against that. But I'm gonna speak mostly about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and explain how they're different and why they are really just revolutionizing the way that we may handle vaccination in the future, okay? So what scientists did for the RNA vaccines is they took part of the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that creates the spike protein, the little red structures that were sticking out. And they put that RNA inside a little lipid nanoparticle container. Now, the reason why they have that lipid nanoparticle container is because that allows the RNA from the virus to enter into the cell. Now, this little bit of RNA is not enough to create the whole virus. So you are not being infected by the virus when you have this vaccine. As you see, when these little lipid nanoparticles get to the host cell, it allows entry for, uh, for the RNA to enter the cell because of the structure of this blue line here of our cell, okay? So once that RNA is inside the host cell, this is called messenger RNA, our cells can then use that genetic information to create the spike protein of the virus. And what we do is we put that spike protein onto the surface of our cells, and then that allows our immune system to create antibodies that are specific for that spike protein. So in the future, if you are infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus, or are presented with it, those antibodies can then bind and create a barrier like Amy said, and prevent that virus from entering into your cells and infecting you. So the spike protein, this little red thing we're seeing on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we know the genetic information for that. And that is exactly this region of the RNA genome of the spike protein is what the scientists at Pfizer and Moderna are producing and putting in these little nanoparticles. Okay. okay. So I think okay. Nicole, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, right? But I think one of the things to say um, I think you have a timeline on here, so I apologize if I'm yeah. jumping the gun, but Nicole will go on to say, this is not new 
information, this messenger RNA and, and the lipids. I mean, um, what did you, what did we say, you know, 1970s? Mm-hmm. I mean, so mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of confusion around, oh my gosh, this is brand new. We've never even, you know, studied this before. And that's, that's really just not the case. So, right. um, right. Yes, exactly. Amy. So what, what she is talking about is the, you know, this little orange squiggly line is messenger RNA and messenger RNA has been studied extensively since the sixties, 1961, when it was discovered. So it is not new technology that is happening in lipid nanoparticles. People have been working on that for at least, at least a, a decade or two more than that. So if not more than that, so this is not new technology in any sense of the imagination, okay? So once we have these spike proteins being shown on our surface of our cells, we create antibodies and we create memory cells. And those are the best cells because they remember that spike protein for a long period of time and can protect us for uh, a length of time. Right now, we don't know how long the memory cells are working for these SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 vaccines but it's our hope that the, the memory will last for a, length, uh, a decent length of time to protect us, okay? So our immune system recognized that foreign RNA and the lipid nanoparticles, and we didn't need any extra things that other vaccines actually put in them to stimulate the immune response. So these are actually simpler vaccines than the a traditional vaccine. More holistic. Mm-hmm, more, more holistic. So why are people so excited about these RNA vaccines? They're really easy to manufacture. They're, that does not require the infectious virus to produce the vaccine. We can rapidly produce messenger RNA by methods that have been studied and used for many years in science laboratories. But the one issue is that RNA is not super temperature stable. So that is why it does require very cold temperatures for storage but the lipid or carrier molecule does help with this. Okay, so very, very briefly, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this, but some people might ask about why we need two shots. And every time you are exposed, like you see with this red arrow here, every time you're exposed to a disease causing agent, you will create plasma cells that make antibodies and memory cells that will remember that antigen. And so every time you are going to be stimulated or uh, exposed, I should say, to a pathogen, you will create even more antibodies and more memory cells. So upon every subsequent exposure, you get a stronger and stronger response. Okay, so the cells that make the antibodies will have memory and they remember that for long periods of time. So it may be likely in the future that you'll see booster vaccinations or it might be a a strategy to combat this in the future. And that is why you, if you're hearing people talk about that, that this slide is an an Mm -hmm. example of of why that that discussion is even occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So Amy, this is what you were talking about earlier. We were going to get to you, right? That yeah. we've been studying RNA and RNA vaccines for many years. This is not brand new research. And this has been this, the basic science that started this, like I said, started in the 60s. So people have been studying messenger RNA for a very long time. Here's just a a timeline, just to get a visual of all the work that's been done on RNA and messenger RNA, right? So messenger RNA was discovered way back in 1961 and all these different types of studies to help us understand the stability of RNA, the, the structure of RNA, how we can actually use messenger RNA vaccines for treatments for infections and cancer, right? So this is not brand new research. Okay, Amy, here we have the herd immunity discussion. That's okay. I think um, Nicole and I were just hoping sort of toward the end of this, we could use this visual to basically um, 
you know, uh, demonstrate through this, through, through the visual kind of what we we're talking about in terms of herd immunity. I know that that's been in the news a lot, uh, trying to help the population reach herd immunity and, and why is that important? So what you're looking at in that top picture is really the blue, which are not immunized, but still healthy. And then you're looking at a couple of people in the red that are contagious there. And um, the picture on the right is really showing you when no one is immunized, what those two contagions, those two that are contagious can do in an otherwise generally healthy population. Disease is gonna spread throughout that population. And obviously when you go down to the second picture and you look at a few scattered immunized and healthy, those who can get immunized and are healthy in that population of blue, again, with just the two contagions, then when you're looking at the picture on the right, you're really looking at um, not, not as many, but that's because we have those five uh, individuals that have been vaccinated, right? So, um, you know, decreasing by, in this illustration, one person. Um, but then when you drop, drop down to the bottom picture on the slide, I think Nicole and I were really just hoping to say, now we still just have the two contagions, but we only have in that picture four that are not immunized, but still healthy adults. And when you look at the picture on the right, now really what we see is just the increase of of one person that is contagious. So when, when you are really looking at this, and, and this is from a study in 2017, basically just saying an awareness of this social benefit makes vaccination not only an individual, but also a social decision. Because let's say that those four people that you are seeing that are not immunized, but still healthy, maybe something in their genetic makeup prevents them from being allowed to get, uh, you know, being not allowed, that's a bad choice of word, but um, able to get vaccinated Vaccinated. And what we really want to do if we are healthy and can be vaccinated is help those four that might not otherwise be able to get vaccinated. And we felt strongly that this was um, just a very good uh, illustration of what we were trying to say about why your choice in terms of helping us get to that herd immunity is important. Um, thanks, Nicole. And then I think we just really said that um, as long as the virus is being spread, again, sort of keeping that visual in your mind, it's going to mutate and find other ways to become more efficient. So if you're hearing in the news at all about the variants and a fear that there is a variant that is stronger, um, that is real, right? These viruses, as Nicole just explained, need a host. Um, they need a way to uh, infect and uh, re you know, reproduce. Um, and so really, when you are thinking about what we can do with vaccinations, the, you know, looking at that herd immunity uh, visual, the, you know, the higher the percentage of the population, the decreasing, it decreases the chance for those variants to really get a foothold and change. And I think we just, uh, you, know, let, you know, ended on the bottom of this by saying we need to try to halt that community spread to stop those mutations. And I'm not going to get into the European Union and what we've seen in some other other countries where their, you know, vaccination rates are very low. But, um, you know, if you're watching the news at all, you're hearing that concern with such a low percentage of the population vaccinated, um, that these variants are going to be able to get a relatively strong foothold. So that's clearly what we are uh, trying to prevent. Thanks, Amy. And, and so I, I do want to point out, there's a lot of studies that are being done currently to look at the effectiveness of these uh, messenger RNA vaccines. They're still effective against some of the variants um, at prevent and very effective at preventing severe COVID against those variants. So you may still see individuals that are vaccinated get COVID because they're not 100% effective, but they are not these patients are not having severe COVID. And that's really important that we prevent that severe COVID, particularly for those individuals that may not be able to be vaccinated. Yep, that's a really good point. Those few blue people that for one reason or another cannot get uh, vaccinated. And I think really Nicole and I, um, we're just gonna finish off by, you know, with that piece about herd immunity to sort of, um, 
you know, uh, tie into not just the history of vaccination as, as uh, we heard first, um, but the science behind uh, how we can create this um, messenger RNA and the vaccination leading to sort of that public health call. Um, and I know, Sarah, that we have you with us for a short amount of time and that I know you're working the mass clinic today, so I'm just going to check in with you if we want to move on to sort of um, vaccination approval and stuff with Lisa Randall, or I know your time is super valuable and I, I want you to be uh, there for the health department. So if you need to go next, Sarah, I'm, I'm happy to pull up your slides. So you just, you just let us know. Thank you so much. We're okay right now. So I think you could go ahead and proceed and I'll wait till the end. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Lisa. Um, I, I think, I think that it's up to you. Okie dokie. All right. I have a PowerPoint presentation to share. Can everybody see it? Maybe? I can. Okay, cool. All right. So um, process for vaccine approval and how to get vaccinated. Um, so I guess um, the FDA and the CDC um, don't just approve vaccines out of nowhere. There is an actual procedure and there's protocol to make sure that it's effective and safe. Um, so when you go to get vaccinated, you should rest assured it's not scary. Um, it is something that has been studied and something that's been tried on people just like you. So is that we're certain that it has a high level of effectiveness. Um, with the FDA and the CDC, there are six steps that occur in the vaccine approval process. Um, there is the exploratory stage, which is essentially the sciencey stuff that Amy, um, Amy and co, all the science people talked about. Um, then there's the preclinical stage. Um, the preclinical stage is essentially um, when they are preparing to uh, um, start administering doses as experiments. Um, they're, they're deciding like whether they're going to use the, the j and J style type thing or if they're gonna use the mRNA ones like the Pfizer and Moderna. And then there's the actual clinical development when they start testing it on people. Um, and there are um, three stages to this too. Um, the first set of trials tests vaccine on, the, on a very small scale, like one or 200 people, like not a lot. The second set of trials tests the vaccine on a larger scale to make sure that the various demographic groups that will be receiving the vaccine react in a similar way. So that white people and black people can feel safe, women and men can feel safe, young and old people can feel safe, skinny and, and obese people can feel safe and on and on and on. Um, they tested on lots and lots of different types of people to make sure that it has a similar reaction on the different types. Um, the third set of trials are administered on a large scale. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people receive um, these uh, vaccines and placebos in the clinical trials. Um, if you've heard of some of your friends or family being part of the clinical trials, this is probably the part they were part of. Um, once it's made it through all of this, the exploratory stage, the preclinical stage, and the clinical development, the three stages of clinical trials, then it goes to the FDA and the CDC for approval. Um, if there is any reason at all for them not to approve it, the FDA and the CDC will say no. Um, our scientific agencies, these two agencies, the FDA and the CDC are considered the gold standard around the world. If we don't approve it, other countries pull it. Um, so after the, um, after the review and the approval happens, then um, companies begin to manufacture the product. Um, in our case, this past like with the COVID-19 vaccines, um, a lot of companies produced the vaccine in anticipation they would be approved. Had they not been approved, they would have been discarded. So know that if something were to go wrong, there is no way the company would distribute stuff that was not approved. Um, and once it's been manufactured, then it can be sent out and administered to people um, and as people are administered the vaccine, some of these people that have been given the vaccine are tracked to make sure there's no lasting side effects um, to, to, to look and see what kind of basic side effects there are um, and so on and so forth. 
Um, okay, so the Johnson and Johnson paused. You all heard about it in the news. Um, Might have scared some of you. Um, why that should actually make you feel better about getting a COVID vaccine. Um, a few weeks ago, it was reported that some people who had received the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, also received, also referred to as the Janssen vaccine, um, had developed a rare form of blood clot. Um, the number of people with this weird side effect was really small, six. Six out of nearly seven million people had this reaction. And because they found it, they paused it. Now, some of you have had statistics and, and you say, wow, six out of seven million, that sounds like an outlier. It is, but because we found it, it's rather, it's better to be safe than sorry. And so Johnson & Johnson was told by the FDA to put a pause on the distribution of their vaccine. Um, this should make you feel good. Six out of seven million caused a pause. That's a really little number. And, and I mean, I got the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and, you know, I am in the age bracket where they say that, you know, the blood clots are likely to occur. All six of the individuals who had this rare um, cerebral or brain blood clot was between the ages of 18 and 40, and they were all women. So I'm here over here, like 37 year old woman, like okie dokie, how exciting is that? Um, th this, this abnormality is extremely rare. So even if you have gotten the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, you should feel safe. One out of more than a million people, the odds of you having this rare thing is almost none. However, um, this, the CDC and the FDA believed that it was noticeable enough. We, we want people to feel comfortable getting these vaccines. We want people to go get them and know that they're safe. And when you find something, you check it. And so that's why the FDA and the CDC have paused this. Um, the FDA and the CDC currently are meeting um, this week to discuss what they're going to do with the vaccine. Um, Dr. Fauci, the, the big COVID guy all over TV, um, and one of the country's best epidemiologists um, suspects that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be allowed back on the market, but with restrictions. Um, so it is expected, it sounds like, um, it will be allowed for use in women over 40 and men over the age of 18. Um, so like people my age won't be able to get it anymore, probably, which is I know, kind of crummy. Um, but it is going to keep people safe and, and put more confidence in people. They got to do what they got to do. The goal is for everyone to be able to get the vaccine, to be protected from COVID, and yet also be safe. And if safety is one of our ultimate goals, this was the right call. Um, and, and there's that. <laughs> I've already told you that I, I, I got the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, my husband did too. Steve got it. Um, he had a sore arm for a few hours and the next day I had a really bad headache and I was really crabby. Uh, but aside from that, like by, by after, right after lunchtime, I was back to my normal, less than crabby self. Um, so yeah. Um, now how do you get vaccinated if you want it? So the Pfizer or the Moderna, um, probably soon to return to the story, the J and J vaccine. Fortunately, the vaccines are becoming easier to get. Um, when Steve and I got ours, I had to get up at stupid o'clock in the morning and go on the Missouri Vaccine Navigator page and look for hours for appointments. And I found one in Warrington. Uh, that, that's not real anymore. Um, like the, the St. Charles City Government, St. Charles County Government, St. Louis City Government all have COVID-19 web pages. And on those web pages are links to uh, vaccine opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm going to provide you links with that in a few seconds. Um, another really easy one to look up the walmart.com, uh, walgreens.com, cvs.com, um, your local drugstore. Almost all of the local hospitals now are taking walk-ins. Um, so it's really, really, really easy to get it now. 
So this is not like I got to drive to Sedalia, Missouri to get a vaccine. This is, I can like go to Walmart in my pajamas. Um, so, so know that it's really, really easy to get now. Um, and the state of Missouri has opened eligibility for everyone over the age of 16. So if you want it, you are now eligible to get it. So you don't have to wait anymore. Um, the link for St. Louis County's COVID page is the first link in a really ugly red color. Um, and the link for the St. Charles County vaccine webpage is the second link in the really ugly color. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys can Google Walmart and Walgreens and CVS and find that. Um, well, well, don't this, be, go ahead. This might just, if, if, I can, if I can jump in here, Lisa, this might be a really good time to bring in Sarah because that's exactly but what yes. she does. She's the St. Charles County <laughs> Health Department person who's involved in, in what I think you're at right now. You're at, a, you're at a vaccine event now. Is that my understanding? That sure is. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm currently watching people being vaccinated in front of me as we speak. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for, for joining us, us today. Um, but Lisa, I, I have, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I have a couple of things to pull up for, for Sarah just briefly. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'm done. So we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Great job. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, just give a few words as we get started here. Um, just to echo what Lisa was, was mentioning is vaccine definitely became more available in the past approximately two weeks. So everyone finally was able to get through their lists of people that they had registered and the previous tiers that were not able to get vaccinated yet. We've been able to clear all those lists out and have it pretty open. So. Uh, we are having our vaccine clinics. We had one yesterday, today, and we have an additional one tomorrow that will be a drive-through event. So tomorrow on the 22nd. And that drive-through event still has appointments available through the Vaccine Navigator website. And I, we decided to move to that Vaccine Navigator state website registration to allow people to know all the events that are available. So um, some people are working, some people have off hours that they're available, some people um, may have transportation issues that get in the way of them getting where they need to go. Um, so we wanted everyone to be able to see all the events that are in the region. So to choose the one that really works best for them. Um, in addition, so our event today that we're hosting at the Family Arena is a walk-in event. So it does require a little bit of walking. Um, we do have some mobility um, options available for people that have that physical um, disability. Uh, but we also have tomorrow a drive-through event. So that's done completely in your car and um, it works very smoothly. Uh, we've all gotten very good at uh, what we do and we're able to work through a substantial amount of people in a short period of time and make it as quick and painless as we can. Uh, so last week alone in three days, we were able to uh, vaccinate almost 12,000 individuals. And so it's, it's a quick in and out process. So we certainly encourage everyone um, to find the opportunity that works best for them. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I sounds like you've done, got, done and gone into a bunch of detail about the vaccine. So I appreciate that a precursor and just want to um, emphasize that piece that for each of the vaccines that are available right now and including the, the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine that's on pause right now, they're incredibly effective. And what that means is, so for the Moderna vaccine, we'll start with that one. That's 94% effective in preventing COVID. Or if you are in that small percentage that does get COVID, your symptoms are pretty mild. And in the studies that have been completed, those symptoms, many have been asymptomatic, didn't even know they had COVID. Um, but one thing that is common through all the vaccines is they are almost 100% effective in preventing hospitalizations and death. And that is super important to those people in our community that do have those severe um, risk factors for COVID. So somebody that has some lung issues, um, they may have some heart issues, they may have some other chronic condition that makes them completely success susceptible to COVID. This is a, a special safeguard for them um, to prevent their symptoms from getting so extreme that they, they can cause mortality in those groups. So that's definitely a huge, huge point to these vaccines. 
Um, for those that might be a little hesitant about they're not in one of those categories of being concerned about those chronic conditions, um, the current advantage is that we believe that vaccine can, we, we're confident that it will protect you for at least 90 days. There's now additional um, evidence over, now that we have some people that have been vaccinated for a little bit longer, um, we know that it's lasting at least six months. And we're, we believe it'll probably last longer. We're just still researching that piece of it. So that allows you to avoid being quarantined if you are exposed. So if you're a person that works in a certain um, industry where you're exposed to a lot of people at a time um, or in common areas or even in healthcare, um, that's a big safeguard for you that you, if you are exposed to COVID in, in your everyday life, that this will protect you from having to go under quarantine. And that's been an, a, a large inconvenience to people that need to work and um, go to school and um, do all their daily tasks. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I'm sure you've covered this already, but so the Moderna vaccine is a two dose vaccine that those doses are happening about 28 days apart. So four to six weeks after your first shot, the second shot will also be given. Okay, I'm gonna uh, change Sarah. Thank you. Oh. So the next one that we talk about is the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine, the bio nanotech. And this one is almost as effective as the Moderna. So it's 95% effective, but again, 100% effective in causing death and hospitalization. Those are a great advantage to those that have high risk factors. Um, the two dose course of this vaccine uh, are three weeks apart. So about 21 days apart. So they're a little bit closer uh, together than the Moderna ones. Um, and then finally, we'll go on to the next slide. And this is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And I think one of the questions that we see a lot is with this, um, this vaccine, what is it so different? And why is it one dose versus two dose? And some of that, those types of questions. And someone will ask me oftentimes, which one would you get? If I have the option, which vaccine would you get? And when you look at this, um, this vaccine, it is slightly less effective in preventing COVID than, some, than the other two mRNA vaccines, but again, it has that 100% effectiveness against hospitalization and death. So that, that's one reason. Um, if you are somebody that has a lot of um, anxiety around needles or has um, a reason to be afraid of needles, that one dose piece um, is an advantage for you. The other science has shown and through the research that those that have severe allergic reactions are the ones that we do have to have concerns about with anaphylaxis to the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine because of that mRNA technology. Well, because the J&J &J vaccine is utilizing that previous technology that our bodies are used to seeing with all the rest of our vaccines, there have been less um, allergic reactions to that vaccine. So less severe reactions to that. So if you're someone that has those severe allergies and we're not talking seasonal allergies, we're talking severe anaphylaxis to other medications or vaccines, this is a vaccine that you should really look at more carefully for yourself um, um, to prevent any possible poor outcome from the vaccine itself. So those are just a few opportunities that I wanted to talk about with the three different vaccine types. Um, so I would love to entertain some of the questions or concerns that I know you've seen from your community, and, or I could talk about some of the questions that we've had from our community here at the, the vaccine clinics. We've had questions pouring in. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm so excited. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so one question I had was from, was whether or not, you, you just mentioned this, uh, we're not sure exactly how long the vaccine lasts. Uh, you would say we're thinking six months now. Someone said, you know, they were told that maybe they should wait until flu season or wait a few more months to take it later to make sure it carries them through. What, what do you think about, you know, if it, if it only lasts a few months, should we wait? No, I would definitely go ahead and get vaccinated as soon as you can. First of all, we, we just don't know because the vaccine hasn't been around long enough for us to have a great gauge on how long it does last. There is a lot of discussion about booster doses as well. So it could and probably will require an additional dose down the line. We want to get that 
Um, Amy mentioned the herd immunity piece of this. We need to break the transmission between the community right now. And although our case levels have gone down quite a bit in the region, we're still seeing a lot of the variants in the community and we are still seeing a lot of circulation in those high risk events. So we need to stop that transmission to end the opportunity for this virus to find another host to start to transmit. So anyone that can get the vaccine should to just try to stop that transmission for our community and we can get a better grip on what's going on and prevent it. Um, we, any, even if it doesn't last as much as we hope it does, that amount of immunity will still be in your body and there will give you some opportunity for your body to prevent a poor outcome. So even if it doesn't last past the six months or we don't believe it has high efficacy after six months, there still will be some residual antibodies in your body and that will give you some additional protection from that. The other piece that I wanna point out is one of the, um, precautions that we have to take with the vaccine is that you should not receive an addition, another type of vaccine within 14 days of your dose. And so when we're talking about putting it near our flu vaccine or putting it near even our back to school vaccines in our children, or somebody that has to receive a vaccine each year for, or are due for some of their routine vaccinations, we don't want to get too close to those other opportunities for vaccination. So we need to make sure we're properly spacing those out. Steve, were you going to say something else? Yeah, so I wanted to add to piggyback along with that. Remember, these viruses mutate also. And so if you're not vaccinated or if someone else is not vaccinated and the virus mutates, if you don't get the vaccine, you could wind up picking up one of these mutations as well. And so you're better off getting the vaccine. Don't worry about getting the flu. Worry about getting COVID-19 or a variant of COVID-19 right now. Great. Thank you. And actually, this kind of relates to another question that was asked about a third shot. And my understanding, and you can talk about this, if there is going to be a third shot, it will be tailored differently, will it not? Or will it, will it be the, simply a third shot of this existing vaccine? I haven't seen the details of that quite yet. Um, it most likely will be tailored just a bit. Um, but the timing of that hasn't been quite made clear. Um, they're still researching some of those points. The other detail that they're looking at, and Lisa kind of touched on this, when they're going through clinical trials, a lot of the, what they're looking at is proper dosing. So they might modify the dosage that is given for these different vaccines. So that booster dose might be um, a smaller dose amount or might be a larger dose amount, depending on the circumstances that they've found the, the best um, avenue. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, I'm more, keep questions keep coming. So, um, sure. and I, I've not heard this, but someone said that heard that there's more of a more side effects with the Moderna vaccine um, since they're essentially the same uh, same process. What do you know why if, if that's true, and if do you know why? Sure. So I actually was looking up some of the um, some of the details last night when we look at severe adverse reactions. So those are the people that have classified anaphylaxis. They've had severe skin, multiple system involvement. So whether that's skin and respiratory or respiratory and GI, um, the number of cases of severe reaction in Moderna is about 2.1 cases per million doses given. So two people per million doses that have been distributed. And for Pfizer, it's actually six cases per million. So that's, again, six people had a reaction in millions of doses given. So it's a very small number. Um, you can hear either way in terms of the mild reactions. So some, um, if you go back and look through the clinical trials or you look at some of the subsequent data from people that have been vaccinated, one vaccine has a more um, likelihood of giving you a headache than the other. One of them has more likelihood of joint pain than the other. So it's kind of the same. It's just a matter in the reality of it is every person's body reacts differently to things. So how um, my body handles a vaccine, even though we were given the same dose sitting side by side at the same time, how my body will handle that will be different than someone else's body. So, um, and also our different levels of pain. What I perceive as pain is different than what my husband perceives as pain. So um, those, those two things are just, um, are gonna be different in everybody. So um, I wouldn't say that Pfizer or Moderna are one is better than the other, or one has more or less side effects. It's really a small amount of, of side effects. And, um, and we, can't gear, we can't determine how your body's gonna to react to one or the other. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll keep coming. I'll keep them coming then. 
Uh, another another person asked, can immunize this? I think you kind of addressed this a little bit, uh, or Steve is addressing that. Can immunized individuals carry and transfer viral cells to non immune? In other words, if you're immunized, can you still be a carrier? Sure, there, there actually was a little bit of unclarity about this in the very beginning. Um, they were, there was some concern that there might be some viral load um, maintained in those that had been exposed after vaccination. And more research was done and more data was collected and it was, there was enough confident data to support that you should not be a carrier and be able to transmit disease after you've been vaccinated. However, there have been some breakthrough cases and just how there are with all of our vaccine preventable diseases, the reason that we still have cases of measles, the reason, one of the reasons we still have cases of mumps or things like that is there are occasional breakthrough cases. Again, everyone's body acts a little bit differently. Everybody's antibody retention and antibody process is a little bit different. So there might be some that didn't have the response that their body should have. And so can they did Can you explain what a breakthrough case is? Sure. That's um, somebody that's been fully vaccinated, but still um, ends up with COVID. Um, the cases that we've seen, um, oftentimes they were tested for some other reason. So they didn't even know they had COVID. Um, they were tested because of their job or they were tested because of a medical procedure or something like that and discovered that they were actually a positive case right now. So they didn't even know. Those are some of the breakthrough cases. The other thing that I'll say about breakthrough cases is most often those have occurred with somebody that had um, a household contact, so lived with someone who had COVID that was unvaccinated, had an active case in their household, and had that continuous, very close exposure. And those were oftentimes a breakthrough case as well. Um, so we, we see that those, those situations do happen and they happen with any vaccine that we have out there. It's part of the reason we still have to get a flu vaccine every year. Um, so that, that does occur, but even um, you still should be vaccinated even if you're concerned about breakthrough cases or you're concerned that you, your body may not react the way you want it to. I appreciate that explanation, Sarah. I'm going to interrupt just a minute, Paul, to say, I feel like that's some of the things people are asking. Well, how did you know that somebody vaccinated? So I, I appreciate you going to that depth, Sarah, to explain. Most of these cases are people who they have a COVID testing policy in their place of employment. They were not exhibiting any symptoms. They did not feel poorly. Um, they literally lined up to get their COVID vaccine. And then they said, you have COVID. And they said, well, I've been vaccinated, right? But when you trace that back, as Sarah said, they are living closely with someone or, um, and again, going back to that 100% um, efficacy on severe illness and death, um, you go back to say, gosh, those breakthrough cases really being, what did you say, Sarah, very, very small amounts, um, I, I think is really an important thing to um, help sort of make sure that people know that information too. Absolutely. I would, um, I think about this a lot in terms of my family and my loved ones is I don't want to be that one that brings that home is I may be fully vaccinated and may, um, you know, we were talking about being a carrier. Um, there's, there's the possibility that my body won't work the way that I want it to. And there's a possibility that someone else might be more susceptible. So no matter where you are, there could be somebody whose body is not, um, is able to manage COVID as yours is. And so we all need to be out here protecting each other and protecting those that we encounter each day. I appreciate that. Okay, if you, as long as you've got time, I'll, I'll keep pump, I'll keep firing away. Sure. Okay. Um, once one person asked um, about uh, kids as young as sixteen getting getting the vaccine, and I'll actually piggyback on because I got a fifteen year old. I would love him to get the shot. Is that going to happen soon? So I'll, you know, someone's concerned about teenagers getting it, and I'm actually saying I'd love my fifteen year old to get it. Sure. So currently the Pfizer vaccine is FDA approved for 16 and up. And that's why um, you'll see that they say vaccine is now available for 16 year olds and 16 year olds and older. Um, Moderna is only approved for 18 and up. Um, Pfizer actually put their FDA approval for the 12 year old to six to up till age 16 year old approval through last week. And we actually anticipate that approval to come through pretty soon. Um, so fairly soon, um, as, low as, as young as 12 year olds will be able to receive the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the Moderna has also is on their way to putting through their FDA approval for some younger ages and both Pfizer and Moderna um, are in their clinical trial process for, un, 
for all the way down to six months of age. So we anticipate that in the, as long as everything goes well in those clinical trials, that we will be able to vaccinate as young as uh, six months of age very soon. And um, to your other question of should I get my teenager vaccinated, um, always is the answer yes. Any opportunity, um, all of our data, and I can tell you anecdotally from our research, from our case management as well, um, teenagers were definitely some groups that were spreading that, spreading COVID very readily. Um, most of them, many of them didn't know they had COVID. They were showing very mild symptoms and just kind of blew it off and were able to spread it to a large number of teenagers and adolescents very quickly. So I would certainly encourage that population just to break that transmission opportunity. And Sarah, when we go back to looking at that herd immunity, those herd immunity visuals, you think about that asymptomatic young, younger um, population when you're asking Paul about a 15 year old vaccinated um, and saying, oh, my gosh. Right. So um, I, I, I appreciate very much that 12 to 16 population um, you know, potentially being able to get vaccinated because they're very social by nature anyway. So I do think that that's going to help us turn, turn a little bit of a tide. I'm sorry, Nicole, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, I was just going to say from the scientist perspective, there are a lot of studies um, going around why young people are oftentimes asymptomatic and stuff. And it has to do with how their immunity develops and their exposure to things. And so that is why a lot of times they have completely different outcomes than older individuals. And there's a lot of work being done on that. That's really interesting. Okay, well, thank you. That's great. Um, all right, and I have a question. I think it's kind of relating to the J&J, the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Um, someone was reiterating um, the, the question about the blood clots uh, and how rare it was. And they're saying, the suggestion is you're, you're actually, your chance of getting blood clots are much higher if you're on birth control. Although I, my, my understanding is the kind of blood clots you're getting from the Johnson Johnson vaccine are, are very odd. Um, and that's what's so weird about it. But it, there, her suggestion was that you're much more likely to get blood clots from birth control. And I, I don't know if, if you can answer that or any, any of my science people can answer that. Yeah, the, I, I would have to go back and look at the rate. I believe it is higher in birth control. I would also believe it's higher in smoking. Um, and some other um, behaviors have a much higher risk of blood clots than in this situation. It is the unique nature of the particular type of blood clot that we're talking about here is, is part of the reason they paused. They just wanted to take a closer look at those cases to see. Um, and there is the possibility that there is some, um, there is some possible um, relationship between birth control and this vaccine as well too, in terms of those blood clots is which one came first? Um, um, was the blood clot due to the birth control or was it due to the vaccine itself? So um, there, I think there's, I agree with um, Lisa's statement earlier that these have been looked at with much more scrutiny than, than things normally would through the process because the process was moved a little faster than normal processes were for vaccine but it wasn't the process itself in terms of clinical trials wasn't sped up. It was just how quickly they were reviewed, how their clinical trials were reviewed um, and approved. That usually takes a much longer time frame. And I can say there's some good videos out the um, American Medical Association and um, you know, others have uh, had some people talking about the very specific kind of um, clot and ischemic attack that occurred with the Janssen vaccine um, and really goes into detail on why they pulled it, what they are studying. So very much in alignment with what Sarah is saying and that other um, activities are um, at greater increased risk for uh, blood clots in general. So I think that's an important thing to, to point out. I have some of those links, Paul, after this, if, if, if you want me to email them to you or something and we can send them out to anybody. But there are some, I think when you're, I put myself in the, um, you know, uh, in the eyes of another sort of looking for reputable information and saying, oh my gosh, you know, uh, the Mayo Clinic, John Hobbs, Hopkins, um, you know, thinking about uh, the, um, 
you know, Journal of American Medicine, some of those places that have really done, Nicola and Sarah, I'm sure you could mention some others that I think really are trying to put some easy to understand information out there so that we can help spread the word about uh, what the vaccines uh, do, why they are important, not just herd immunity, but also, um, you know, uh, their efficacy and the risks. And so I feel like sometimes part of this battle is discerning what's good information. Um, and, and so I, I think, I think that's a really important. So I, th I thank Sarah and Nicole both for those uh, explanations. Well, actually that, that relates to a, a question. I, I'll skip ahead because it's directly tied to what you just said, Amy, is we hear the scientists like yourselves telling us to get the vaccine outside of the science, how can we further encourage our friends and family to get the vaccine? Do you want to take that, Sarah? <laughs> That's the million dollar <laughs> question of the week. Um, so now that we're actually uh, have enough vaccine to go around and we're seeing that, uh, for example, yesterday, not all of our appointments were taken up with for first dose vaccine. And our, we have appointments still available for tomorrow. And that's that's unique to us this week and some other um, counties were experiencing that previously. And now that's our question of how do we reach the people that are not vaccine adverse? They just are either on the fence or they're not willing to go through a whole lot of trouble to get the vaccine. So if it's convenient for them, they'll go ahead and move forward. Um, so that's a lot of our question is um, trying to figure out what groups we're talking about. Are we talking about the people that still have questions and how can we answer their questions adequately to give them the information they need to make a safe decision for themselves and their family? And to that answer, I would always say, let's, let's send them to the FDA and the CDC yeah. websites. Those, the amount of information that's been shared about these vaccines is, is fully available. So you can read everything firsthand and is very transparent on what's going on with these vaccines, how they're created, how they were researched and where they are now. So those are the people I would send there. Um, as for the other group of they're either on the fence or they have some hesitancy or maybe even just a little bit of laziness. Um, how do we reach those populations? That's definitely the questions where we're at now. And it's just continued education of, um, I have more concerns about COVID and bringing COVID home to my household than I do about these vaccines. Um, I think it's always um, interesting to watch how someone is willing to take medicine for something but not something else or willing to take a vaccine for, for one thing but not another. Um, so a lot of that is just the continued education effort of explaining to them why it's important, why it's important to you um, as protecting you and talking about I don't want to go back to the days where we are all in quarantine at our homes and no one's allowed to work and no one's allowed to go to school and no one's allowed to do any of those things. And if we don't continue to break the transmission of this, the, these hosts and take away the opportunity for the, for the virus, then we're going to be right back in that situation again. And I do think that I was just looking at the at the list that I put together, like I said, not just Mayo and, and Hopkins Medicine, but as, as Sarah is saying, the CDC site in general, I linked on here to a, a cdc.gov slash coronavirus. They're also trying to put some uh, vaccine videos and um, really, I think, trying to keep up. And as Sarah said, determine what is this aversion? I mean, are they worried for their health? Are they somebody that would get it if they knew that it was more available? I mean, uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, being more specific about which population of people. But I appreciate the question for this call, Paul, because maybe what the what the person who wrote it in is really wanting to know is just what can we do? And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is saying, you know, I wish today I could put a sticker on, you know, on my on my Zoom message uh, that would say to people, I've been vaccinated. Maybe I need to sign my emails with like letting people know you know, it's okay to come and ask me some questions or I chose to do this or somebody like Nicole who has that same information so that um, so that people understand that we are out there and that we are, um, you know, open to having these kinds of discussions and answering these kinds of questions. One of the questions that we hear a lot is the concern of the, over the mRNA technology. And I think Nicole, your points that this is not something new this has been researched heavily. It just hasn't been utilized in a vaccine yet in the forefront. And that's the new part. 
it's the same thing of people are concerned that things went too fast or that that this was pushed through approvals and that's not how it all works you know so just explaining those processes yes your body hasn't seen mrna used and used in this way before but it your body knows what to do and you know everything is working the way it's supposed to be working it's just a little bit different of a process that we had to utilize because we're in the middle of a pandemic well, let me, let me follow up a little bit, because one of the things that I, I think would encourage people to get the vaccine is figuring out what you can do once you've been vaccinated, or even, I mean, one of the questions was, can the government and our, our workplaces require the vaccine for employees? So is, do you know if there's going to be, if you don't have it, there's real repercussions, or, and what, what can you do if you do have it? What, 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 what does that mean for your freedom if you've been vaccinated? Because I've been vaccinated. I've, I've got, it's been not, well, just almost two weeks now since my second vaccine. So I feel like I'm Superman or something. Right. Well, the, the first thing that CDC did come out straight out and said that if you are not, if you are fully vaccinated, you can be around other fully vaccinated people without a mask and, and have safety in that. And that's, that's a huge deal for people. And to be able to see some of our loved ones that we've been trying to protect by staying away, um, you know, that's definitely been an advantage for me. I haven't seen my family in a year because I had worries about their health. And so I kept them and my family away from them. But now that we're fully vaccinated, we can go see them and feel comfortable and they're fully vaccinated, so we can go. Um, so that's a lot of it. In terms of the requirements, um, there, there have been a lot of discussions of what businesses can require someone to be vaccinated and whatnot. And I will just say on the general terms that if there's a private entity, a private entity can, um, just like they can require you to have certain vaccinations to work there or to do certain things like drug testing or you know, certain other things, a, a business can re make requirements of their employees. Um, so that is that is a possibility. Um, there are discussions at the state and federal level of whether that'll be utilized or not. And um, I'll stay out of those political discussions, but, um, but it's, it's definitely a possibility that that could be a requirement um, in certain aspects, just like vaccinations are required in certain other um, businesses or agencies. Okay, um, I mean, we, I've, I've got a couple other thoughts, but I mean, we're, we're uh, it may be a good place to wrap up. Are there any other last minute comments, suggestions that people wanna say? Um, I just wanted to speak of one other thing, if that's okay. Please, yeah. Um, so one of the kind of the parts that we do or that we take part in is called sewer shed data. And when you think about it, it's gross. Um, but one of the things that we know about COVID is that it's shed in the body for quite some time. And that includes in your fecal matter. So um, one of the projects that is ongoing throughout the country is assessing all the sewer data and looking at sewer um, and testing that that basically looking at that fecal matter in an area to see if there's any information about COVID still in that, in that group of people or in that area. And I will say that we, the sewer shed project in Missouri um, is been in action for quite a few months. And we, there is some direct correlation between what we see in the sewer shed data and the outbreaks that come after that. And so we know, and it makes sense, that if someone is currently shedding COVID in their fecal matter, they have COVID in some capacity and have the likelihood that they could pass that to someone else. And so when we see that sewer shed data, so that aggregate look at what is circulating in the sewer data, um, right now we are seeing a continued spread of the variants. So yeah. we have very active UK variants in all of the sewer, sewer shed data in the, almost the entire state right now. And more recently in the sewer shed data in the St. Charles County, we have seen two new variants show up. So it, these variants are starting to circulate in the community in enough capacity where we can see it in the sewer data. So they're there, they're very active in the community and that is something that we need to be, have heightened awareness over and continue to take these other steps and precautions with with our actions. Can, can I jump on that just real quickly, just to follow up on that? Do the vaccines um, protect against the variants as well as the standard, whatever, whatever the standard uh, uh, COVID-19 was? Right now there is good coverage with the vaccines and the variants that we're seeing. So the variants that are real active in the US right now, there's a couple new ones that are starting to show up um, in a few other countries and in other states. And right now everything is, has good coverage. 
Um, so I don't know if Nicole wants to add to that. Yeah, no, I was just going to say a lot of the studies have even shown that it does a very good job of preventing the severe COVID, like we had discussed before, that the vaccine is protecting against severe COVID on these variants from various origins of these, like the Brazil or the South Africa or other types of variants. And, and what I've heard is one reason for a vaccination to get, the, get as many people vaccinated is that the more people that have the disease, the more likely you're gonna have variants because the variants are, are exactly. just reproducing. Mm -hmm. and, and so to, to stop, to make sure we don't have variants that are immune to the vaccine, um, we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Yes, we do. That, I think that's the take home message from Amy and me that we want to yeah. end that community spread so that we can prevent those mu mutations from occurring so that we don't have a problem of now we have to create a whole new vaccine and start this all over again, like Sarah said, where we might be in quarantine again. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. And thank you, Nicole and Amy and Lisa and Steve. It's been uh, I, I, the comments are glowing here on, on, the, uh, on the YouTube page. So fantastic panel, very educational. And I really appreciate all your time. And, and Sarah, so, so much for you taking time out from your important work. I appreciate all of your efforts uh, at the community college as well. And we appreciate the constant and continuous um, collaboration opportunities. So I wish you all well and encourage everyone to, to check out our website if you need vaccine information or if you need assistance in getting vaccinated. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.